I think we have Dr. John Knight who will be talking on open surgical management of carotid and vertebral artery disease. Thank you. All righty, no, no delays this morning. Any questions? Everybody out there? Anybody awake? Anybody alive? Who, uh, who wants to do karaoke? <laughs> Spence, ready? No, not really. I, I sometimes showed this when the cardiologists are in the same room and they have never seen a plaque. All of you guys have probably done endorectomies and seen these plaques, so this is not as important. Except to remember, when you actually take the plaque out, always put your magic dust in like that to keep it from, uh, to keep it from recurring. You know, it is actually something that I've thought for years that it's kind of amazing and we don't do is we actually have the opportunity to do something locally to that vessel that, that uh, say, a, a catheter-based person doesn't. And I've always thought you should spray something on there or treat it or chemically do something to it so that it wouldn't get restenosis. You know, there should be some kind of paste you can stick on there. We, we use some stuff out of uh, rat sal I mean, uh, bat saliva, you know, part of the, uh, the whole uh, collagenase that, uh, you know, is part of the leech spit. Uh, and it does kind of passivate the surface where you sort of cut off the collagen that hangs out. And so somebody in this room ought to figure out something. Every time you do an endarterectomy, you could locally treat that vessel with a chemical that would passivate the surface so junk doesn't stick to it and you get less in animal hyperplasia. That's just a free hint. So when you, when you make a fortune, just uh, send me a dollar. We're going to talk real quick about a few things on carotid endarterectomy. Uh, you know, basically remember... It's mostly due to emboli, not due to decreased blood supply. It's hard to decrease the amount of blood getting to your brain. I mean, you, you're going to have damn near four-vessel disease that's severe. Mostly, this is an embolic problem. Uh, is there any difference between conventional and aversion endarterectomy? Who's done an aversion endarterectomy here? So I see one, two, three, Murray, four. Uh, aversion is a great technique because it eliminates the problem of having to put a patch. So for women, for instance, aversion is a nice technique. Uh, I don't think there's any evidence that there's any difference in the outcomes, but that's probably just because it's kind of hidden in the type 2 error. Uh, but for again, for small women, it's very effective. And for situations where you have a lot of kink or coil, Aversion is great because you don't have to figure out any other tricky thing you do. You just chop out the bad section and reimplant it. It's hard to shunt, though. If you think you really are shunt dependent, you really functionally can't do it because you have to complete the endarterectomy before you put the shunt in. What about the type of anesthesia? There's uh, NISQIP data looking, uh, generally speaking, NISQIP says about 85% of patients currently are done with uh, general anesthesia. There's really no difference in outcomes, though, between the two, and that's been looked at a couple of times. There's a Cochrane review from a few years ago looking at the same thing. So choice of anesthetic is really a fielder's choice. Uh, we talked a minute ago a little bit, heard a little bit about uh, indications for treatment. You just have to know the NASET numbers, even though these things were published about 25 years ago. It's kind of fundamental foundational data that you can't not know and be a vascular surgeon or a vascular therapist. Uh, obviously, the thing to remember is that any ipsilateral stroke, essentially this trial was stopped by the NIH because the difference in these two treatment groups was, was so dramatic. You know, you, it's, it's, you, you forget now, this sounds like, well, it's just a study, but at the time, this was very controversial to take people who had symptomatic carotid stenosis and randomize them to six-pack and a fishing pole treatment. Uh, you know, we, it, we had been doing endarterectomies for a long time, and to, to sort of have to tell a patient, I'm pretty damn sure you're going to go have a stroke and send them home on aspirin was, was challenging, but it gave us incontrovertible evidence that it was actually beneficial. And that's the, this is really the data that you, you just can't, can't, can't not know as a vascular surgeon. There was a very dramatic difference, obviously, in treatment risk in the uh, medical and surgical groups. So for symptomatics, basically a TIA or ischemic stroke in the last six months, if you've got a high-grade stenosis, unequivocal indications for treatment. The 50 to 69, on the other hand, though, the benefits were much less dramatic. They were much less clear. So it's a, it's a little fuzzy when you get to 50% stenosis with a symptomatic patient, and less than 50%. 
there's no evidence, at least, that endarterectomy is beneficial. Again, you're treating individual patients, and if you look at somebody's CAT scan, you've got a really nasty-looking carotid, and you've got a very dis a distinct TIA, it'd be hard not to offer an endarterectomy in some of those patients. But uh, generally speaking, the severity of the stenosis does correlate with the likelihood of benefit from intervention. You need to know about uh, this idea of the near occlusion, and hardly anybody really mentions this. So when, you, when they went back and looked in NASET, these people had had basically sort of the collapsed ICA, and essentially what that defines is uh, sort of the size of that distal ICA, and more importantly to me is the, there's the sort of exuberance of the collateral pathway through the external. So when you see this the picture on the right where you've got a great big external with lots of collaterals, and if you looked at the brain, if it's kind of like the profunda in the SFA. If the, if the profunda beats the SFA to the knee, then your SFA is not doing you much good. And the same thing is true. If your external beats your ICA to the brain, do an endarterectomy in that patient actually has, was not statistically beneficial in uh, NASET. And you sometimes see these people and you, have to, you go through this conundrum of trying to, uh, is that distal ICA going to open up once you fix the proximal stenosis or is it, or is it just an atretic vessel that's kind of lost its uh, vitality? Sometimes you just don't know and you just give it a shot. But beware that there is a concept of near occlusion and at least statistically, there was not a benefit for surgery in those people because the risk of stroke was higher at the time of surgery. You can, do, you can look at some ratios in terms of essentially the size of the ICA versus the, the CCA, uh, but it's at least, I think, if you got something from, from the, this boot camp, just remember there is such a thing as a near occlusion, and then go look it up and, and then tell your attendings, hey, why are you doing that crazy operation? Because it's probably not going to help them. Timing of CEA has sort of evolved quite a little bit. I think there's pretty good evidence, uh, and I'm just going to give you the snapshot version, is don't operate right away after a stroke, non-disabling stroke, I meaning give them 48 hours. That, that initial period is just like swelling after a sprained ankle. You don't really want to be there when everything is just swollen. When the brain has just been slapped around, give it a chance to kind of settle down for a couple of days. Uh, on the other hand, you don't want to wait forever. You know, if you wait six weeks, most of the benefit of the endarterectomy has really been lost and you're almost back to essentially treating asymptomatic carotid stenosis. So your window of appropriate treatment, I think, for stroke is in that sort of two days to two weeks window. Uh, now, if you have a big stroke, then you got to have, then there's, that becomes really fuzzy. If you've lost your whole hemisphere in a massive stroke, what are you trying to protect? I mean, endarterectomy is always an operation to protect for the future. It's not trying to harvest any benefit now. So if you already got a huge uh, stroke, uh, you know, you have to really decide, are you ever going to treat that patient or you wait for a substantial period of time before so. Only times that that's really different is the sort of crescendo TIA, and really crescendo TIA is, there's, there's, there's not a classic picture of this, but this is a guy you've, or a woman that you've got in the hospital, you know, you're waiting to, they're on a heparin drip, they've got a tight stenosis, you're waiting to do them, and they have another event. These are people who are having events under observation. Sometimes you just get sort of stuck with, I've got to do something, I can't go on and allow this to go further. That's not a good situation for the patient or for the doctor, and you really need to hang plenty of black crepe with families and patients that our hands are sort of tied. We're getting twisted and forced into this. Sometimes you have to do it. Asymptomatic carotid, as uh, Dr. Misra was saying a minute ago, you know, this has evolved quite a little bit. You know, when ACAS was first done, that's the asymptomatic trial, the big trial, uh, you know, the numbers is sort of 5% versus 11%. Virtually all of you sort of have to be able to spit that out, even when you talk to patients. This is fundamental, again, foundational data for a vascular surgeon. That's for any stroke. If you look at major stroke, it's only half that. So when you tell a 75, 85-year-old guy living in a nursing home in Terrell that he's got a 94% chance of not having a stroke, at five years, if you just send him home with aspirin, and you can improve that to 97% by slashing his neck open, most sane people are smart enough to realize that's not a real big benefit. And it's, and then that's the reality of what the facts are. And then if you're a woman, there's even less clear benefit 
from endarterectomy in an asymptomatic patient. And this comes from back, you know, the, the, there was a big VA trial looking at asymptomatic patients and ACAS. And these, you know, basically calculated you had about a 2% risk of stroke per year. These were all done back in the 90s before statins and before fancy aspirin and Plavix and, and whatnot. And uh, when you get down sort of these more modern studies in the late uh, 2000s, there's a whole cluster of studies that sort of looked at asymptomatic patients. And the benefits, uh, the risk of stroke had dropped to about a half of that. So you're in that sort of half percent per year risk of stroke in the asymptomatic patient. And I th you have to be pretty cautious. The people that are asymptomatic, in my mind, that I, I tend to operate on would be people who I observe changing from a 50% stenosis to an 80% stenosis. I'm not sure that a fixed 80% stenosis is particularly dangerous. It's the changing stenosis that, that catches your attention. Uh, uh, and women, you know, hardly ever. And then obviously the person that converts from asymptomatic to symptomatic, you think about doing. But I think you ought to be cautious in the asymptomatic patient that you're really sh uh, benefiting them uh, rather than benefiting yourself by doing endarterectomy and asymptomatics. What is best medical management? Well, it's not just a baby aspirin half a day. I mean, it's, uh, there are a whole component, list of things that we kind of do, let's face it, sort of slap shot kind of treatment, honestly. Uh, we, none of us, that, well, maybe some of you can honestly answer that you really make a big effort to uh, achieve smoking cessation for these people. But mostly we sort of say, quit smoking, and then we throw them out of the office. They come back and see me uh, when you get a symptom or when you've progressed. Uh, but in reality, we probably ought to make a better effort in, in some of these things. And diet, for instance, we don't really reasonably do that, do we? I mean, we, for the most part, vascular surgeons, we might as well have ashtrays in our lobbies, you know, if we really want to get five-star ratings. It's just my advice to you. Third way you look in the asymptomatic patient, how do you figure out who to treat? The, the problem right now is we don't have a good way to look at the, the, the vulnerable plaque. So how could you do it? Well, you would look at either the effect of the stenosis. So if you had a stenosis in the neck, it's asymptomatic, you say, is it bad? Do I need to take it out? Well, you could look downstream at the brain and say, do I have a bunch of pockmarks in the brain on MR? as a sign, even if these are asymptomatic pockmarks, you could look in there and say, well, this is somebody I probably should operate on. And there's pretty good evidence that silent brain infarcts are associated with a higher risk of subsequent stroke. Doesn't take a genius to figure that out. Another thing you could do would be to look and see, is there debris in the blood that's traveling to the brain? About the only thing we've done so far to look at that is with TCD, but if you put a ultrasound on somebody's middle cerebral artery and you count debris clicks going to the brain and you have a lot of it, well, that's probably not as a good situation and probably that's somebody you might lean towards doing endarterectomy. And that's been shown that people who have positive TCD evidence of em embolism are higher risk than people who don't. None of you have done this in your office. None of you have done this in your residency where, you've, where you have typically actually done this. It's a bit of a laborious test. It takes about an hour to actually sit and listen and click and you know, count these clicks. But the reality is if we had a good way to do that, it would be a better way to identify the asymptomatic plaque that probably should be removed. And the third way to look at the plaque would be to directly look at the plaque. And there's a zillion things that people have looked at. Just about every imaging technique that's available, particularly ultrasound and MR, but even OCT or FDG PET, looking at different ways, try to characterize the plaque that's active. Instead of when you open up a carotid and you, you've done an asymptomatic carotid stenosis, you open up the artery, it looks like a slick piece of, uh, you know, keloid. It's shiny, smooth, the surface is not ulcerated, and you think, I'm not really helping this person. Because again, embolic, embolism is the problem, not the severity of the stenosis. So most carotid endarterectomies in the United States are performed for asymptomatic patients. It's like 90% of them, which is sort of not terribly surprising, just like doing atherectomy in your outpatient lab. Most asymptomatic patients don't have a stroke regardless of what you do. The asymptomatic, the history of the asymptomatic patient is really pretty benign. Doesn't mean CEA is not safe. If you look in the big uh, NIS, uh, NISQIP or the nation, nationwide inpatient sample databases, the risk of CEA is only about a half percent per year. It's a really safe operation, or uh, perioperative is half percent. It's a very safe operation, but just because it's a safe operation, if you're treating a benign disease, it's really not a benefit. 
What about aspirin? Uh, short answer is there's no, no clear data that dual antiplatelet therapy is ben beneficial in, the in carotid disease. Generally speaking, there's not an indication for anticoagulation. Uh, reasonably low dose aspirin is so effective that if you can get people on that and stop smoking, you've jumped up so clearly on the benefit curve that addition to that is hard to prove. Prophylactic CEA before a cabbage or other general surgery procedures, you're going to, some of you will be in situations where your cardiac surgeons are going to ask you to do this. As far as I can tell, there's no good evidence that prophylactic endarterectomy is actually beneficial. Uh, in terms of reducing stroke. Similar is true for carotid stenting. Even though you've got a tight carotid stenosis, again, you, if, you, if you do a carotid stent and then go do a cabbage, what are you going to do about the antiplatelets? Because they get pretty excited about not having people on Plavix. So now you put a fresh stent in somebody's artery going to their brain and say, well, this is better than just leaving them alone and doing surgery per, and doing your uh, coronary operation. My personal feeling is you're better off just letting them do their procedure. Uh, it's a good idea to try to get a good technical result. The type of patch probably doesn't matter. I think most people probably use pericardium now, but remember it's not probably any less of a synthetic piece of material or foreign material than uh, shoe leather. Uh, Post-operative complications, the uh, only, th only thing we need to say this morning is try to avoid them. Uh, <laughs> Post-op stroke, this is the only thing I did want to take a little bit about is that, you know, routinely we've said post-op stroke, the sort of, what's the standard answer for post-op stroke? Go back to the operating room, which to me is just stupid. In this era, I mean, what you want to know is do they have a technical defect at the site of your lesion or have they embolized? That's the only question you're trying to answer, and you can really do that with ultrasound. So if you put an ultrasound on somebody's neck and you see that your surgical site is clean, Going to the operating room is just going to put handcuffs around you and you've got a middle cerebral embolus. So personally, although I wouldn't answer this on the boards because everybody's been trained to go back to the operating room, it reasonably it seems to me that you want to prove this site's clean and then you want to know what's going on in the brain. Do you have an embolus or do you have a bleed? And neither of those things can you answer in the operating room. So you all think about it, what you're going to do, but that's uh, the... To me, running back to the operating room is just kind of something that we did when I was a resident, and I'm not sure it really comports with current practice. Follow-up, uh, you know, it's hard to argue with that, isn't it? Uh, you need to follow up people. Good luck. Vertebral artery disease, you know, you're going to do one or two of these in your lifetime, and there's a chapter that Dr. Greg Pearl wrote that's in the Scientific American on vertebral artery disease, the best uh, article ever, better, best summary chapter. I would just tell you, go read it, because you're not, you won't remember it if I tell you, and uh, it's so infrequent that you do it that you just got to go relearn it every time you do it. That's what it looks like if you do a perfect vertebral to carotid transposition, which is way by far the most common operation you'll ever do rather than trying to op, you know, do a bypass to V2. Has anybody done a bypass to V2? I mean, they're, you know, they're really one in a lifetime kind of cases. So, all right, let's quit. Thank you very much. Appreciate your time.